This podcast is sponsored by Zoll, with resuscitation solutions for all patients, hospitals, and providers. Zoll helps address electrical, mechanical, and metabolic resuscitations. And post-event, our comprehensive software solutions support continuous quality improvement. Zoll, embracing and driving resuscitation innovation for over 40 years. Learn more at Zoll.com. Hello, and welcome to the Society of Critical Care Medicine's iCritical Care podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Margaret Parker. Today, I will be speaking with Paul E. Pepe, MD, MCCM, on the article, Rationale and Strategies for Development of an Optimal Bundle of Management for Cardiac Arrest, published in Critical Care Explorations. To access the full article, visit ccejournal.org. Dr. Pepe is Professor of Management Policy and Community Health at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston and the immediate past chair of emergency medicine at UT Southwestern and Parkland Hospital in Dallas. He is also the global coordinator of the Metropolitan EMS Medical Directors Alliance and the medical director of the Dallas County Emergency Medical Services in Dallas, Texas. Welcome, Dr. Pepe. Hey, thank you very much. And it's really great to be interviewed by you because you're one of my favorite people on the planet. And thank you so much for uh, having me here today with you. Well, thanks. Paul, before we start, do you have any disclosures to report? Well, only that I'm not a morning person and all the coffee in Columbia wouldn't make me so. So that's about it. There's no, you know, there's no complications whatsoever to disclose. Okay. Uh, Paul, you have a very long career in resuscitation research, including several dozen clinical trials in cardiac arrest and trauma that go back up to four decades. What prompted you to do this study? Well, that's a good question. Not to bury the headline, we have been frustrated for the last decades with the outcomes of multi-center resuscitation research that involve randomized clinical trials. And the RCTs are somewhat compromised in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest because because of the multitude of confounding variables that get in the way, and that's part of the problem. And so we've really searched for an alternative, and that's what we're going to talk about. But if I don't know if you'd indulge me, let me give some background as a setup, you know, uh, what's happened in my own career here, because it leads to how we came to this. And it's not just me. It, it, we came to this with about 36 other scientists from around the globe who are very veteran at doing studies in resuscitation research in the odd possible setting. So um, I'm here today largely because I started my career in Seattle as a critical care doctor doing both pulmonary and critical care and then later surgical critical care working with the likes of Leonard Hudson, James Carrico, Joe Savetta, among many other terrific mentors I can go on all day. But if you were to ask me, like, what were the two main things that I learned from these master clinician investigators? Well, I'd say, I don't know, uh, well, one, the rationale for challenging conventional thinking, including some sacred cow interventions. And in turn, that perhaps we should spell research as research, R-E-S-E-A-R-C-H, that we should continually research. And so, um, and it's probably the origin of the word in a sense. And so that's what they brought to me. So my first New England Journal RCT on early PEEP application for vent ARDS and later uh, challenges to time-honored practices like uh, liberally infusing isotonic IV fluids before control bleeding. I mean, they're both two good examples of how they opened my eyes about continually researching our practices. And I became, at that time, Okay, uh, zealous advocate for RCTs, at least at that time, and you'll see where I'm going here. Okay, but I think the fact that they said let's think a different way is the important aspect there. So, what was the second thing I learned? Well, the second major lesson was how to properly communicate scientific methodologies. The, the grand old masters of science from prior centuries had taught us that a successful experiment in the laboratory is only successful if other scientists could reproduce the same result. So therefore, a really detailed approach needs to be documented and communicated. And this is a key thing, including the intimate details and nuances of specific procedures, techniques used, and you know, definitions of variables, which was a key thing. So for example, in defining complications, uh, how would one define that renal failure has occurred or, I don't know, uh, aspiration or sepsis, et cetera? 
So, for example, I had the luck of working with Professor Carrico at Harview and then later Joe Savetta in his shop in Miami. And that immediately taught me that their respective definitions of ARDS, a very basic concept to us today, or ventilatory techniques, were, were far different. And uh, clearly, this could lead to conflicting findings, conflicting interpretations, and inclusive consensus. Uh, so when working on the first prospective study of ARDS clinical predictors and risk, this caveat was so useful to me, and the resulting paper actually led us to what we typically identify as the syndrome of sepsis today. So why were these seminal experiences in great lessons important in Apple today's publication we're discussing? Well, today's topic of RCTs for out-of-hospital sudden cardiac death come into great question because of the experiences we had at that time. One of the critical care areas, if you can indulge me just a few more minutes, was the critical care is what we paid a special attention to in Seattle with auto possible cardiac arrest. And I suddenly became a sudden death interventionist who quickly surmised that the earlier the intervention, the better the result. And over the ensuing years, I actually uh, was on scene sometimes 15 hours a day going call to call and develop the physical, literally the physical techniques and nuances that expedited care, uh, developing I don't know how to say heavily pre-rehearsed like pit crew, like choreographies. And I guess ninja like skill applications that did not interrupt chest compressions. And they got the first round of drugs in right away and accomplished within seconds sometimes. And we also configured the 911 system. So the majority of calls were handled by basic EMTs and a smaller cadre of highly skilled medics were spared for the five to 10% of EMS responses that actually required advanced skills. This gave us people who could ninja like get these things accomplished right away because they do it all the time. And we paid attention to the quality of CPR, the control of positive pressure of ventilation, and other variables that could impact uh, circulation. So, what is not recognized, and here's my point in decades of consensus protocols, are those subtle aspects of, uh, of what constitutes good care out there and, uh, and to help you get things done. So, um, what was this study about? Uh, you want to, I don't know if you want to take over right now and ask me a specific or some pointed questions. No, you've given us a great background and a lead in. So, so tell us about this study. How did you do it? And, you know, tell us about the approach to the study. Well, so there were, uh, several dozen of us who had been doing this work for a long time. have been kind of frustrated, I mean, quite to be very blunt, with the results of randomized clinical trials, uh, RCTs involving autopossible cardiac arrest. And many of us have actually recognized the, the reasons why. There are just so many variables involved that if you, you, know, you do some training and you put people through whatever practice sessions and you give them a piece of paper that says, here's the flow chart of what you need to do, um, it can often, uh, and without paying close attention to what they're actually doing on scene, um, that can lead to uh, problems in terms of real compliance if you say a study is supposed to be controlled. So a good example is there's been, I would say, I don't know, dozens of cardiac arrest trials that have been done that came to conclusions that we're all kind of scratching our heads about. Things that work so well in the laboratory uh, just didn't play out on, on the streets. And we're understanding why would these trials come out as a neutral trial or why didn't it work out there? Um, and, and so there's so many reasons for that. I mean, one of it is the time intervention. So if you told me you used an AED, uh, did a study and every other day you had it out there for people to use in the public and said, we didn't find any difference my immediate reaction goes, are you kidding me? I've done studies and that those work really well, you, you know, not just in a laboratory, but out in the field. And, um, and so I would say, well, what was the first time you gave a shock? And, and they go, well, oh, everybody got shocked within, you know, 12 minutes. And I got 12 minutes. And because uh, you know, just a matter of minutes can make a difference there if you don't get it shocked right away. And that's the same thing we found with studies with epinephrine or various other drugs that were given. And then there are surrogate variables, for example, in one study in which cortisone, amiodarone was actually found to work, but it was only witness cases. So that made sense. It's just that the, sometimes the interventions are not done soon enough. Um, there are trials in which people, are, unfortunately, our studies have been kind of binary studies. Uh, you know, in other words, it's good or bad. So there was one study uh, recently of, um, well, I mean, for example, in Europe, they know very well TXA. If you just take the crash two 
trial and several others since then at face value that if you give the drug within the first hour or less, you could have really great outcomes. Uh, and But if you give it later, then you have actually much worse outcomes, even in terms of mortality. So it's not something's good or bad. It's how you use it, when you use it, what dose you use, and how you deliver it, and all the other factors being controlled. So in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, there are so many variables that it just it gets out of there. But one of the key things was the quality of CPR. So I'm going to give you a terrific example of that. We did what I would call the gold standard study uh, of an intervention. It was something called the impeded threshold device, elegantly designed. It was NIH funded. It was multinational in the sense that Canada and U.S., about 150 agencies participated in this, uh, EMS agencies. And uh, you to enter into it, you had to demonstrate that you're capable of doing good CPR. Uh, you had to demonstrate that uh, you could achieve all these things. And you had a good reputation for being a great system up front um, before you even got, has to be in the, uh, the, the investigation. So it was really elegant in the sense that everybody got an ITD, but half of them were inactivated so that you were blinded to that. It's published in the New England Journal. And what it found overall was there was no difference whether you use this thing or not. So half the people got what we call a sham valve. In other words, it was inactivated, and the other half got it, and they just didn't see any differences. The problem for that, and that's where the, I always talk about EBM versus EBM, evidence-based medicine versus experience-based medicine. Just like I told you with the, um, the AEDs, the automated defibrillators being used so late, you know, we were scratching our heads, some of us, and go, wait a minute, this thing like, really works, so why did it not work out there. And in fact, it had worked in several other trials that had been done. So we went back and looked at it. And one of the things we had just been working on was the concept of how the quality of CPR really affects outcomes a lot. And then one of our questions was, could it affect the intervention? Is there an interaction there? So we actually went back and, and some people would say this is data dredging, but these were actually just, the, it's just in a way the opposite. These were prospectively collected data. <clears throat> We, um, they were there, and so we later went back, just asked a new question and said, let's test this against the data. And we said, does the quality of CPR, the rate, the depth, uh, the number of interruptions, does that, does that you know, have any effect here? And it was dramatic, actually. When we went back and looked at it, we found out that if you, the, first of all, the majority of people were not getting quality CPR. Uh, and I'm going to talk about even using liberal criteria. It was being interrupted too much. It was either too fast, too slow, or not deep enough, et cetera. And if you accounted for those things, each one of those things had an impact on the outcomes if you use the ITD, this impedance threshold device. Okay. And, um, but more importantly, if all those things were together, it was dramatic in terms of the, um, the survival rates, it at least went up, you know, probably something like twofold, et cetera, if you're in the sort of so-called sweeter spot of not interrupting and getting the right rate and depth combination. In other words, rate affects depth and depth affects rate. So we wanted to look for the optimal combination, which we did identify. And we found within that special area, which is around, you know, around, let's say 100, 110 compressions per minute and a depth of about, I don't know, two and a half inches or so. Um, if those were in place, the it had a dramatic improvement in outcomes. So the original study, the New England Journal paper I told you about that was published that didn't show any difference in outcomes, um, in a sense was diluted with all these cases. But it's an accurate study. It, it, what it says is if you do not account for that variable, CPR, okay, then um, you're not going to get any difference in outcomes. Okay, and, and it's, So that's accurate. But if you do account for it, you can have a lot of saving effects. So the issue of, again, the binary equation, this thing is good or bad, it kind of depends. If you get good quality CPR, it works really well. But if you're not, you're not going to see any difference. You got to have both. In fact, some of us would say it may cause some harm in a sense if you're not doing it right. So all that has to be put in place, just like we talked about TXA being given late and it might you know, cause some harm. So point is, is that there are so many confounding variables, and I just named one. I mean, positive pressure ventilation is one recent study. 
uh, you know, that was done that was classic, it showed that people were being breathed at 35 breaths per minute, you know, and when probably you should be giving one breath every 10 seconds or so, or a little bit more if you have something that enhances flow like the ITD or other, uh, other pieces of equipment. So anyways, here's the summary of what I've been rambling about. What, what am I trying to say here? We have found it, it, it over the years, dozens and dozens of clinical trials have been done at great expense, time consumption, and you can't control for all these factors. It, it'd be better sometimes if it's done in a single system, probably, where you might be able to control it, but uh, we were not able to find any differences there. So you're asking now, that's the background. So why did we do this? So what we did, we got a bunch of scientists together and say, is there a better way of doing it? And one of the questions that came up was the old masters, as I had mentioned before, said, you've got to be able to reproduce this in another laboratory. And so to do that, you better have all the components lined up and all the nuances and all the little subtleties uh, put together in there. And when we got together, we went and found a whole bunch of cities that actually had done very, very well across the United States. We took 10 EMS systems from all over the country that were reporting tremendously better outcomes. And we wanted to see what did they have in common? And so maybe where, where were they? Could we reproduce things? Are they the same there, et cetera? So we wanted to know if we could create a roadmap that others could do. So we got these 10 cities together. Uh, we had them give reports. We detailed line by line inventory the things they were doing. One of the things we found was they were doing things, a lot of them were doing things that were not in the mainstream, at least not yet. Um, uh, of, uh, and a lot of it involved technology. So for example, they had infiltrated their cities with technologies with uh, on their t mobile app that you could, if a cardiac arrest occurs, it sends a signal out if you're nearby, it tells you to come do CPR or it tells you where the AED is. Uh, there is widespread CPR training. There are techniques, including some technological things that are in the dispatch office that expedites uh, how you give the CPR instructions over the telephone. I could go on and on. Uh, but more importantly, on scene, we were able to have mechanical devices that deliver the, the CPR accurately with the right depth, the right rate, without interruptions, or at the very least, gives feedback to those people there what they're doing. We were make sure that we were on scene controlling ventilation so that we weren't overzealously giving positive pressure ventilations. We, all, all those things were in place, and the nuances of if you're going to put a mechanical device on, that would be okay, but if it takes too long, it's going to be harmful. So the techniques of trying to get this on almost seamlessly in the ninja-like factor within a, you know, in a ninja-like fashion within seconds, you know, has been documented and put out on videos and everybody was trained accordingly and they practiced it well. And there's a lot of pit crew rehearsing that goes on. Then I can go on and on. These cities also found that they had ECMO available to them. They, they had all had resuscitation centers set up in their communities. So you knew to go to those places where you could get a cardiac cath, that they would do hypothermia, that they would get you on ECBO if needed. So it was very, very fascinating that they all had these things in common and they were independently finding the same results and they were able to reproduce it in there. So what we did was we took things and we went through one of the things, for example, we found things that somebody had that was incrementally improving their outcomes. Uh, but others didn't have, we all asked them, would you put this on? And most people said, yeah, we would. And so one thing, for example, is the issue of using uh, the impedance threshold device, something that creates uh, a, a sort of, for example, kind of a suction on the chest and not only compress, but then decompress and allow more blood flow, say, out of the brain and into the chest again. Uh, so you're enhancing venous return here. And then also we found that, taken from other critical care specialists, we actually found that if we gradually started raising the head during the resuscitation, not immediately because that could be harmful, but gradually elevated it, we found this out in the laboratories, it makes tremendous difference. We were able to improve outcomes. In fact, significantly, if um, it was coordinated with all these other uh, things, because it turns out they're synergistic. And so... Um, it's been fascinating to see that uh, these things were being coming adapted and so on. So we created a roadmap and that's what this paper is. So in summary, what this paper was, a bunch of people who are really smart uh, about physiology came together with the folks on the ground who are actually could implement this and have been implementing it pretty well and got some advice about how to do it or the trades that they had 
to make sure things were quality assured, that they were being tightly controlled. And, um, and we put together that in a document of inventory of the things we found or to what we also recommend if, not, if all the systems were doing it. And going forward, we hope we created a roadmap that others could adopt. So we see this as a possible alternative to the RCT because the RCTs have been misleading, they've been conflicting, and they've taken time and effort and lots of expense and wasted many years, I think, in some respects, where we're in a stalemate, where nothing's getting approved or, or in consensus documents saying, well, there's not enough evidence for it. So I guess the idea here is that maybe we listen to the old masters and we say, okay, let's create the roadmap that we got to the success and let's see if it can be reproduced somewhere else. Now the purists may balk at this and I don't, and they see it's a slippery slope to get away from rigorous science, but I'm not sure in the case of auto hospital cardiac arrest, that really will ever be achieved or at least the way we've been doing it. I'm not against, I was remember I'm the first person to want to do randomized clinical trials, but in this situation, we may need to look at the reproducibility um, model, so to speak, uh, and at least try that out to get some budging of the survival rates that remain pretty dismal in most places across the country. Um, by the way, we did road test those 10 cities against uh, other great systems that have reported results, and they were all significantly well above what other cities were doing, and they had all adopted these new technologies and approaches and, and system-wide high it's not only it was not choreographed on the scene, it was choreographed across the whole spectrum. It created a bundle of care, as we call it, and it's a bundled approach. And this bundled approach appears to be working, at least so far. And we love anybody else to challenge us and to research this and validate it. I think it would be really cool. So, anyway, so that's the background. So go ahead and ask me more questions if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you have, I mean, your group has done a really great job of creating this roadmap, um, resulting in a, a pretty complex bundle. Um, but you've also demonstrated you put it all together, it makes a big difference in outcome. But it's some of the things, particularly some of the technologies you've talked about, um, not everybody has. They may be not interested. Uh, particularly easy to implement um, or reproduce. What are the barriers? Would it cost a lot to do all of this? Is it worth it for a system to look at your roadmap and bundle and say, you know, well, there's no way that we can do items A and D, but we can do B, C, and E. And is it worth doing, uh, and I just use those as random, you know, descriptors, not as any elements in your bundle, but is it worth doing part of the bundle if you can't do the whole thing? What are people out there who are trying to improve their systems? Um, what do you think they should do with what you've put out here? Well, so first of all, to answer your question about, let's say, it's, is it going to be difficult to do this? Is it expensive? I think that uh, enough of us, enough experience has gone down with some of these things to find out that it really made a difference. So I think there is really pretty good inferential information that it's worth getting. But let's say, how much does it cost? When we put this all together, including, let's say, the 12 lead EKG that you already have on board, you know, the monitor defibrillator, if you put in all that, if you amortize it, let's say, over the life of the technology, three, four years, it would the additional cost would end up being somewhere in the ballpark of about $13,000. And that's being liberal about this, okay? Um, $13,000 a year for each ambulance, for example. Now, what's the cost of running an ambulance? Most of them are anywhere at the cheapest, maybe $500,000 a year to over well over a million dollars a year, depending on the salaries, because the staff is round the clock with at least two paramedics, for example, um, and so on. Um, it, it, that, that ambulance cost goes way up in that most of that salary. The actual, let's say, replaceables or other components are really a small thing. So this is like nothing compared to the overall cost. I mean, it's something, it's an increment, it's a, whatever it could be, it's a one or 2% increment in your annualized cost. But uh, we think it's worth it to do this. We do a lot of other things that we spend money on. And uh, I think this is a great way of doing it, especially if you're getting better outcomes and you can document it. The cities that have done this, the outcomes have been incredible. They have had tremendous support from their citizenry, let alone uh, the people that decide their budgets, et cetera. So that's one thing. 
Um, the other thing is there are a lot of components to take, and you may not have success if you don't pay attention, but that's a kind of one of the subtle things that this paper talked about. It said that most of the people who were in that room said, you know, it's just not a piece of paper that you get a bunch of stuff and then you give it to them and you make it. It's got to be, you've got to, all that really intensive training has to go into it, the choreography, the quality assurance. I mean, right to the point of whatever you want to do to make sure it's getting done right. And I think that's a subtle thing. So I, I, going back to the, my original background, like when I left Seattle, I was brought to Houston to do the same thing because the survival rates were very low there where we had really great survival rates in Seattle. And one of the things I found was that people were being trained in a school and then sent out to go do it, but no one was watching it to see what was happening. So I was out there in the streets and I was able to teach them some of these nuances. And it was dramatic within a matter of, months if not a year we were we we were resuscitating three four five people a night two or three of whom were going home so previously they'd had no survivors and now all of a sudden they're getting nearly a thousand people back a year and it was it was but the part of that was paying attention to the details showing them the, the the expediting the technical skills aspects of things and making sure that everything was done to expedite care on scene and so that was just part of it is the reproducibility also has to do with supervision and the training and uh, all the other components to make sure it goes in. So can other people, people may not be able to do that, especially if you're in a small town or you have a medical director who can't give that kind of effort. But most cities, at least the large cities where the huge populations are, where we have a lot of cardiac arrest, um, are able to afford multiple medical directors and are actually sending them out into the field now. And so I think that... Um, I think that it's it, it's not easy. This none of this is easy, but if you want to save lives, you can. And I think what's really cool is that we're saving a lot of lives in these cities now that have attempted to get a little intrepid, try something innovative, and done it in a conscientious quality assurance fashion. And that's what's been good about this. Yeah, it sounds like one of the uh, key elements of this is a really robust approach to quality improvement. I mean, well, that's what all these, this study was about in a sense, these individual communities were doing um, quality assurance things because they say, hey, let's see what happens if we yeah. do introduce this thing and let's do it right, let's pay attention to it and let's see what happens. Okay, so it's a classic, it's a classic quality improvement project. So maybe that's an alternative to the RCT. I, I'd love to be able to do RCTs and cardiac arrest but we've been trying it for 40 years and, and it's been very disappointing because of all the various variables that not one control, but within your own system, you might be able to control it much better and get a better answer. And I think um, kind of reading between your lines, you know, a, a smaller system that maybe can't do everything, maybe doesn't have ECMO, maybe doesn't uh, uh, have the ITD, um, but at least the quality assurance to the the starting basics, making sure there's good CPR, making sure ventilation is appropriate, and some of the other things that you uh, talked about and have outlined um, can at least make some incremental improvement, I would think. Yeah, and I think it's becoming standard now to have uh, CPR feedback systems on board. If you can use mechanical machines and do it right, all those the way I've talked about it. It, it, you can actually be done. For example, the ITD will give you a, bu a boost in outcomes, as we just mentioned, if that's the only intervention uh, based on the clinical trial I talked about before. If you're doing quality CPR right, you'll get a boost. So if you want to get a major boost, you do all these things. But if you want to get an incremental boost, you, you, can, int you can introduce some of these individual uh, pieces and it will make a difference. Sorry, that. And it's it's the same old thing. It's kind of the whatever you call it, the um, you know, people would say the Hawthorne effect, but the study effect that anytime you look at something, you pay more attention, it, people <laughs> perform better too. So, um, uh, but I think these are real, real, but we've now kind of shown that these things all have a tremendous difference. I'll tell you, I'll give you a quick example. Palm Beach County, Florida um, was doing sort of standard things and they had pretty good outcomes compared to most other places throughout the state didn't have as much bystander CPR as you would. And we're talking about Palm Beach County, not West Palm Beach or town of Palm Beach. We're talking about a very huge geographic expanse, um, diverse population, extremes of age uh, and extremes of uh, wealth, et cetera, 
you know, one end to the other. And uh, so it's just a real mixed population and a challenge, but they were doing pretty good. Well, they were using the impedance threshold device and the ITD and, um, uh, I'm sorry, the ITD, and they were using a, a mechanical CPR device called the, the Lucas device that many of you know about. And that had been, they, since they had put those on, they were, seemed to be getting better outcomes. But when they now introduce something as simple as gradual elevation of the head um, up to about oh, something like 20 degrees, so kind of a head up, thorax up uh, procedure, um, their survival rates jump dramatically within a matter of months. And it was actually, and that's just by looking at it by months, but as they went from almost like from station to station doing the training, you can palpably see the outcomes getting better. And later we showed in the laboratory, the reason why that happened was that the combination of those three are synergistic, each are contributory, but head up alone is a little bit better, but it definitely doesn't do that much. But if you combine it with an impedance threshold device and a Lucas device, you get a real synergistic effect. That was a profound study when that came out. And um, I think it was um, presented last year at the uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine. But that just shows that any community can come along and just make one or two pieces of adjustment, it can really make a difference. And I'm the first person to criticize the historical control, but this was profound to see what happened there. Great. So what are your take-home points that you want listeners to take home from your study? Yeah, that um, most of you have been, the takeoff is one is that most of us have been very confused and scratching our heads over the outcomes of randomized clinical trials in uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, uh, very disappointing results. And as a result, we haven't been able to make a lot of progress in terms of getting people a consensus on where to go. The results are conflicting or they're inconclusive, et cetera. And that's been frustrating for us, not only here in the United States and North America, but across the other places in Europe, for example, I just heard talk to people there. So it's been discouraging and we now know why. There are just too many variables. A lot of things are not controlled. Maybe they're impossible to control, maybe they're not, but it's just been very hard and we've spent a lot of time and effort and money. It's been just disappointing. So we're just saying, is there an alternative? And the alternative might be the issue of reproducing what happens in one laboratory and by knowing all the methodologies all the way across as best we can and learning about them. And if you want to get better at it, introducing it to your place, go see how it works elsewhere. And, uh, and so in other words, let's go to the other person's lab and let's learn about it. And now let's reintroduce it into ours and see if we can reproduce it there. I'm just trying to break the stale mail. This is just one way of doing it. Um, and for those of us who needed a pragmatic solution to um, decades of frustration about progress in cardiac arrest, I've been very excited because this looked like it's the same way. And there was these, you know, 36 people who were involved with the paper uh, who all feel the same way. And these, some of these people were the ones who have conducted a lot of these clinical trials and were really supportive of, uh, of the efforts in randomized clinical trials, but of course have become frustrated themselves. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for uh, talking with us today. It's really interesting um, stuff, and I hope will drive widespread improvement in resuscitation. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. So again, uh, just for going, it looks like I'm still learning from my professors, I'm still going after the sacred cows and still learning how to make <laughs> uh, really good methodologies that others can reproduce, okay? So. That's great. This concludes another edition of the Eye Critical Care podcast. We have been speaking today with Dr. Paul Pepe from Dallas, Texas, about the article, Rationale and Strategies for the Development of an Optimal Bundle of Management for Cardiac Arrest, published in Critical Care Explorations. For the Eye Critical Care podcast, I'm Dr. Margaret Parker. This podcast is sponsored by Zoll with resuscitation solutions for all patients, hospitals, and providers. Zoll helps address electrical, mechanical, and metabolic resuscitations. And post-event, our comprehensive software solutions support continuous quality improvement. Zoll, embracing and driving resuscitation innovation for over 40 years. Learn more at zoll.com. Margaret Parker, MD, MCCM, is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics 
at Stony Brook University in New York. She is a former president of the Society of Critical Care Medicine. She is currently serving as associate editor of Critical Care Medicine and senior associate editor of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine. The I Critical Care podcast is the copyrighted material of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and all rights are reserved. Statements of fact and opinion expressed in this podcast are those of authors and participants and do not imply an opinion or endorsement on the part of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, its officers, volunteers, or members, or that of the podcast commercial supporter.